Thank you for joining us today for our Understanding Eosinophilic Esophagitis webinar. I am Jennifer Gertz, Director, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and our guest speakers today are Dr. Vishal Avanashi and Kirsten Wingate. A bit of background to today's session. Food allergy is an immune-mediated condition, and as many of our listening audience is well aware, Food Allergy Canada has a significant focus on IgE-mediated, those at risk of anaphylaxis. However, we recognize that there's a growing need for information on, shall we call it, the other classifications of food allergy, including EOE and FPIs, which is why we reached out to our two speakers with expertise in EOE, and we're delighted that they agreed to share their information and insight with us. Let's do a quick poll just to get a sense for who's joined us in our listening audience. So if you would just select one of the options that best describes you. We'll wait just a minute while we get the input. It looks like we still have people joining the session as well. So we're gonna give it just a few more seconds. And let's see what our results are showing us. So we've got uh, some of the audience have been diagnosed with EOE. We have about half of our audience, almost half of our audience with patients with EOE, some that are in the process of getting a diagnosis, and we've got a good uh, portion that don't fit into any one of those categories. Thank you very much for giving us some insight on that. Before I introduce our two guests, I want to go through a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. Secondly, all participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. If you have questions during the session, please submit them in the chat box through the webinar and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. Now I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers for today. Dr. Vish Avanashi is a pediatric gastroenterologist at BC Children's Hospital, involved with the Complex Feeding and Nutrition Service and is a co-director of the Eosinophilic Esophagitis Clinic. He is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. We also have Kirsten Wingate to join us here today. She is a dietitian at BC Children's Hospital with the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. She has previously worked as a research dietitian with the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of British Columbia. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Avanashi. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, Jennifer, and I appreciate uh, all the work uh, you and your team do at uh, Food Allergy Canada. Uh, I think it is a great chance and uh, this topic is perfect in the sense that there is a thirst for better understanding eosinophilic esophagitis and you will hear me call it EOE mostly from here on in. And uh, Kirsten and I are going to go back and forth and share information and we will leave time for questions so thank you very much. The, the objectives are relatively broad. What I mean by that is we want to understand what are the common symptoms, uh, we want to review how to get to a diagnosis, and broadly talk about treatment. As mentioned, this is not for individual, individualized catering or counseling, but you'll at least hear the common terms, references, and approaches taken by us and our team. And there's no reason to think we're behaving or uh, having clinical operations different than others. I do wanna highlight the picture in the bottom right of what an eosinophil is. It's a type of white blood cell and it isn't on its own uh, pathologic. So they're actually, that's a picture of it circulating amongst other red blood cells. So it does have normal function as well. 
The term is descriptive, although still a mouthful. Eosinophilic esophagitis implies there's inflammation of the esophagus, that's the itis of the esophagus. And then the eosinophil is the, the uh, what's infiltrating the esophagus. And in uh, plain language, it is spoken as an allergic condition caused by the abnormal presence of eosinophils, a type of white blood cell in the wall of the esophagus. Normally, there should essentially be no eosinophils in the esophagus, and there are other areas where they are supposed to be there. But something in this condition, and that we'll talk about the triggers later, is drawn and pulled into the esophagus. This does result in changes that we can see to the lining or what we call the mucosa. And you get a pattern even visible to the naked eye. And we'll show some pictures, real life pictures later. But these are some of the descriptions, including rings, ultimately narrowing, but we hopefully they're not seeing that because that's a later effect. White specks, or sometimes we call them exudate. And furrowing is kind of like long lines that we see. It is in the bottom left showing that that is driven by when you take samples R, we see lots and lots of eosinophils and their recruiting type cells. Jennifer appropriately highlighted that food allergy is a mixed bag of things. And this is a slide showing that this is a condition that's considered mixed IgE, so relative uh, immediate uh, response uh, and non-IgE mediated food allergy. Um, and it is something that I will say the immune system is extremely complicated and our understanding is growing on a week by week, month by month, year by year basis. But it, the more you learn, the more you realize how complex it is. I won't talk a lot about basic science, but it is an area of interest because I know the audience is quite uh, diverse today. I'm going to highlight a couple cases and the first would be our pretty uh, classic patient, a teenage boy, a 15 year old, who uh, quite gradually has been saying that he feels like food gets stuck after he swallows, after he's eating food. It's without a doubt worse with dry foods, worse with things like rice and meat. Typically you can have ground meat, but not so much steaks. Uh, and in particular, he even had one episode where that piece of steak got stuck for even as much as five minutes. During that time, he could breathe but he had to try to drink it down. He uh, gagged a little bit and eventually it was able to pass without it vomiting, but that was quite an uncomfortable and scary episode for him. In retrospect, even though he describes for about a year, he's been noticing the food get stuck, both the combination of talking to him and his parents, he does describe being really quite a slow eater. Uh, he's the last to be at the table, requires kind of encouragement to be done. Uh, and that's for foods he likes and doesn't like alike. He essentially needs a glass of water by his bedside, or not his bedside, is at the table. Uh, and for him, whether it's habit, he's unaware, but he definitely knows that he needs to take a few sips to help wash it down. Uh, he cuts his food a little bit more than others in terms of uh, uh, fork and knife type foods. And he does chew a lot, although that's a hard subjective thing to uh, describe or categorize. In the past, he's otherwise been a generally healthy guy. When he was younger, he had more problems with asthma. Uh, now it seems to that he's not on any regular treatment, but he gets some occasional colds that trigger a bit of wheeze. But for the most part, he's been well and not required too much maintenance uh, treatment. Uh, he does have seasonal allergies, so he knows it's most spring uh, and summer where he gets stuffy nose and stuffy eyes. And he does have an epinephrine auto injector for a peanut allergy, which he was diagnosed quite some time. Hasn't had any recent uh, peanut exposures, but does carry his, epi, uh, his epinephrine injector with him. Our second case is differing. The patient that can't give you too much of the story but uh, these are some indirect things that have been shared and uh, culminated to a doctor's visit where the focus is on used to be growing better, not so much now. This described kind of the third percentile seems to be slow in growth. He, they really have a hard time moving beyond the bottle. Uh, he was always fine with drinking, but he did have around 12 months of age or around one year vomiting that he didn't seem to have 
Um, before I used to have a bit of reflux, regurgitation, a little bit of spit ups, but the vomiting's become more pronounced now. And they haven't been able to move them beyond the really thin puree. They, there's a picture of a puree pouch um, and most things have to be really smooth, otherwise he gags very easily. He has uh, treatment for eczema, which is predominantly on his face, and uh, does use a topical or cream first type of steroid. So through those two cases, I'm trying to highlight uh, essentially a couple and key features that we see in terms of what we ask, we call it history, but those are the symptoms that patients complain about. Um, I will tell you there's no one specific symptom that if you hear it means they have EOE, which means it's kind of a clustering or constellation, and we'll talk about how to confirm that. But it, you know, there's not, you can't look at a patient or even examine a patient and support that they have EOE. The earlier symptoms are different than the later symptoms, the more classic you know, I think develops uh, once they're eight, nine and above, but here it's described as 11 years old having dysphagia. That term means difficult swallowing. Sometimes it's painful swallowing. Um, if they have symptoms or de descriptions of episodes where food actually is getting stuck, uh, that is something else, else. And this is typically the history we hear for adult patients. And the thing, although it's not a linear line towards it, what we really want to avoid, and not everybody gets this, is what we call strictures or those narrowings of the esophagus. The childhood presentations do vary. It doesn't mean that it's discrete separate boxes, but abdominal pain can be thrown in there, although there's many other causes of abdominal pain. Vomiting and bad reflux in kind of your school, early school age kids is definitely one of the symptoms. And in the infant type population, there obviously, as we mentioned, they can't verbalize, but it's uh, either poor uh, progression of textures, uh, feeding difficulties, sometimes quite an aversion to certain foods, and it can also be overlapped with vomiting. And you can see, uh, and this is a slide showing different presentations with age. Some of the clues or risk factors that we ask about are, well, we don't ask about uh, sex so much, but uh, we definitely know this is a condition that affects males more. About three quarters of our patients are male. Three quarters in the uh, Canadian context are Caucasian. Uh, we have also in BC, particularly a fairly large South Asian population, whether it be India, Sri Lanka, but we have a relative underrepresentation of uh, East Asians, so that'd be the Chinese population. It's not to say none of these are absolutes, but it's less common, and that's something we have described. While we'll always ask about family history, we know that most families don't have a history of EOE. Probably a few reasons behind that. The first being it's not uh, something that was described before and even uh, multi-generations ago, especially whether it be the grandparents or otherwise. But some of the indirect things you may hear about is more about, uh, oh, uh, dad always has problems also with swallowing, avoids these foods, um, sometimes also they may have even had scopes and if there's been histories of narrowing or need for stretching that's extremely relevant and over time I think our threshold to biopsy even if a scope has been done is changing because EOE is now a more leading cause of dysphagia or difficulty swallowing than other things where we often attributed it to reflux before. The Particular overlap here we've highlighted in both the cases is that the vast majority of our patients with EOE have some type of atopy. Atopy is a cluster of term we refer to as uh, things such as asthma, eczema, seasonal allergies. And then food allergies is a, like a, even the anaphylactic version, the IgE one, can be as often as one quarter of our patients. Also it depends on your uh, referral patterns and, and who's involved with your team but that's above uh, the general stated general population. As you can see with this, mostly these things being three quarters, I leave that number for simplicity, but you can have a female with no A to B and still have EOE. So that's why you're not safe to rule things out just based on risk factors. This is a review of our registry involving uh, around 200 patients. And we uh, have been fortunate 
families have been generous in sharing, obviously, de-identified type information or pooled information. And you can see there is a clustering of a lot of other things. Um, now, these are based on self-report, so I want to highlight a couple things. So one would be the food allergy. And as a self-reported food allergy, it says in, as many are 40% plus, which is very high. The milk allergy is not referring typically to the anaphylactic IgE, uh, but we see maybe a higher clustering of even those with cow's milk protein allergy, which we highlighted as a non-IgE type allergy for uh, different presentations such as uh, blood in the stools, et cetera. Well, I'd like to think uh, we're getting better and better uh, with regards to getting the right patient to scope and uh, into our follow-up clinic as soon as possible. We do know that it's, um, it takes more than just thinking about it, whether it's the time to presenting to healthcare because it's something that's been there for a long time and now what's the difference between I've always had this or had this for a long time and something some triggers it over. Uh, but we know that it does take even as much as on average two years from the onset of the symptoms to diagnosis, with our average age being somewhere around 11. Although there is a young infant diagnosis and then all the way in pediatrics, we follow up to up to 18 years of age. Um, obviously that time will be shrunk if uh, the symptoms haven't been even barely acknowledged or not too much of an interference. But if you have a sudden food impaction and you present to emergency with food stuck, those cases are more challenging, obviously, when uh, anytime you can't be able to tender your secretions, we do suggest uh, you present to emergency. Uh, and then while two years is a long time, because again, it often goes from primary care to uh, gastroenterologist to endoscopy time, and there's lots of variables that go in that mix, uh, we know that older patients, probably because they've been habituated to these symptoms for many years, uh, have even longer, and some argue even as an average of four years to time of diagnosis. The algorithm for diagnosis is something that's the same everywhere, so it's not depending on your individual doctor and what they feel. But it, it have, you have to have the clinical symptoms, which we've kind of highlighted above. The next part is the con confirmation biopsies done, obtained through endoscopy, where they look at the uh, tissue, which is very small, a few millimeters, and look under a, a high-powered field, which is through their microscope, and count the number of eosinophils. The consensus group has had different diagnos uh, diagnostic criteria at different time points but this is their most recent 2018 one. And then after, it's also about thinking, is there any other obvious cause of eosinophils in the esophagus that's not EOE? So the count number that sometimes you'll hear reference is more than 15 per high power field. While this is almost its own talk, we can talk about are there other ways to diagnose it? Um, or even track and follow up, but I'll, as a simple point, I'll say for now, the endoscopy, sometimes called a gastroscopy, sometimes called an EGD, is the gold standard and is necessary for uh, obtaining the tissue and the biopsies. So this is uh, just a visual for those watching to kind of identify what a normal esophagus looks for. Light pink, nice uh, lacy vessels, and kind of a smooth contour. The next picture is a patient with EOE, and you can, it doesn't take a highly skilled person to say that just looks quite different. The black arrows are showing the long, what I call railroad tracks, I call them, but the proper term is furrowing. The white arrows are indicating circular kind of rings, and that's sometimes called uh, tracheolization. Uh, and the white, uh, the black circle around a white kind of, kind of fleck or um, we call it an exudate, but it's kind of little blobs. Uh, that is felt to represent uh, eosinophils in kind of clusters or sometimes called microabscesses. And that's characteristic features. Now you don't have to have all the above, but uh, it is a good visual clue. Although even if we see this, we must obtain biopsies. <laughs> 
I will comment also about up to 20% can have normal visible, uh, what we call macroscopic features. So what we see with the naked eye looks fine, but you can still have findings under the biopsy. So these are the biopsies. On the left is the normal esophagus. You can see we call it squamous, which you don't have to remember the names, but it's kind of flattened going from the bottom. Uh, and it's kind of, a, this is a, a barrier created uh, and there's lots of smooth cells. And um, you can see the bottom part at the bottom of the screen is where it gets produced. And we call that the basal layer. And the rest is just stacked as a protective layer. You can see on the right, whereas the patients with uh, EOE, while we do uh, rely mostly on the um, biopsy eosinophil count, there are other features. And it, you can kind of see around the cells, there's kind of more white space or circular for it. And the base layers kind of now expanded and moved up. And then the arrow is kind of highlighting the eosinophils, which uh, we showed earlier, but are kind of clustered towards the surface and we count them. The team's job and the doctor's job is to think about, are there other reasons for having the eosinophils in the esophagus? And um, for the most part, the, uh, generally the, uh, beyond reflux, the conditions are relatively rare and have to be in, put in the context of other things. But um, I will highlight soon how things have changed with reflux and being part of the diagnosis. What I will highlight is this is a chronic condition, meaning it's not age-based. It will not get better necessarily with age. There's maybe the rare exception, and I'm thrilled to hear about those, but for the most part, this will stick around, even if the symptoms are getting better or you're just simply more used to it. And that is a reason for both getting a diagnosis and having a team to follow up. We can't just use symptoms because we see both examples, and this is not just us, but the, they have looked at the association between symptoms and endoscopy findings and biopsies, and they're not perfectly correlated, meaning we see patients with tons of symptoms and there's not much to see on the biopsies. Vice versa, we see patients who essentially say they have no symptoms and we see a lot of visible changes both in the biopsy and the, uh, through the scope. So this is something that we will ask about symptoms, but there is still a need for uh, some overall follow-up. I will highlight no matter which, we're gonna get into treatment soon, but no matter what, we essentially have to continue some type of treatment because currently, if we had a treatment that you just give something once, we would call it a cure if it could go away. But we do know that most of these interventions, when you stop them, the inflammation will come back. The natural history, uh, as suggested in this article, is that as time goes on, what you start out as inflammation moves towards fi inflammation with fibrosis, which is kind of scar tissue. And then after a while, the inflammation, whether it's there or not, you're left with harder to treat kind of thick fibrotic tissue or scar tissue. And that's what contributes towards your, uh, what we call that stricture or narrowing. And at that point, the, the, uh, the, what the diet slash uh, medications can do is felt to be less and less. And that's why those who maybe have been dealing this with, with for decades and decades, they've shown even a percent risk, not by days or weeks, and that's why it's never a rush decision, but for every year of symptoms, this is again in retrospect, uh, you're gonna have an increased chance of having the narrowing. Uh, and so they do see even uh, have a model where they're showing a decreased average size of the esophagus if you have untreated EOE. Uh, and if I was being the scary person, I would highlight how essentially 85% uh, of people who have not treated their EOE for 20 years will have strictures. Although I think there's many people who have EOE and don't know it and don't necessarily have strictures. So we do have to pay attention. The diagnostic criteria were changed so that you no longer need to be on an antacid ahead of time prior to diagnosing, uh, which is something that changed in 2018. Um, and we'll talk about it as a treatment very soon. But the only current predictors of who's gonna develop narrowing is kind of how long you've had it and whether your active inflammation is controlled. 
we're moving on to our next section and obviously beyond the symptoms going away, which is the thing that patients want the most, uh, we do want to obviously prevent complications and ideally that fibrosis. We're now moving into the section related to drugs. Uh, drugs, uh, it, the reason that you sometimes we we'd call it uh, pharmacological treatment, but they use call it 3Ds, drugs, diet, and dilation. I won't focus much on the dilation because doing dilations or stretching doesn't deal with the underlying uh, condition, but it's something that at times we have to do. But we'll talk predominantly about drugs and diet. And obviously, Kirsten, our dietitian, is going to talk more about the diet. And hopefully, you'll also have a better understanding of these terms, empiric versus elemental versus targeted. And then we'll talk about after that the different uh, medications that can be used. When we talk about our treatment goals, we want everything to be perfect. We want no symptoms, we want zero eosinophils, we want no side effects, no strictors, good quality of life, something that's affordable and something you can go uh, on do for a long time. But my sad reality is that uh, uh, you know, essentially, there's nothing uh, that I have to describe in 2020 that deals all with those perfectly. So essentially, we're left with teeter-tottering the risks and benefits of each. And But the good news about that is that it doesn't mean there's one right treatment and one wrong treatment. It is something that requires individual consultation. And hopefully, your gastroenterologists here, uh, you know, we have a combined input and, and they work with a dietitian, they work with an allergist, and uh, we found that uh, model for our clinic very useful. So as mentioned, we're first going to talk about diet and uh, I'll ask uh, Kirsten to carry forward from here. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Avanashi, and also thank you to Food Allergy Canada for having me here today. So my name is Kirsten. Um, yeah, so we have two treatment options uh, for EOE, and as a dietitian, I'll speak to diet. Um, just to recap, the goals of treatment with diet are the same as the general goals of treatment that Dr. Avanashi just described. So we're looking for improvement of inflammation of the esophagus, as well as improvement of symptoms and for something to be sustainable, maintainable for families. There are quite a few different dietary um, options for management of EOE that have been looked at in the research. And from this slide, I'm gonna kind of give you some broad categories of what they are. Uh, on the left, there's an arrow which shows increasing ease as we go down the list. And on the right, there will be an, there's an arrow showing um, that the diet at the top is the most effective. So unfortunately, um, the most effective diet is the hardest to implement, and that's the elemental diet. And then as we go down, we have a six food elimination diet, a four food elimination diet, a two food elimination diet, and a one food elimination diet. And I'm gonna go through these. So the process of dietary treatment on a very general level that most of the research studies will follow is that obviously we have your um, establishment of uh, your diagnosis, which involves an endoscopy and biopsy. And that's also the baseline. And then the treatment has begun. And for diet, these are generally food elimination treatments. And um, the time frame can change, but generally is a minimum of six to eight weeks. Uh, and then there's a repeat endoscopy and investigation to see if there has been those improvements. Um, and in general, we are looking for those eosinophils to have dropped below that 15 per high powered field that Dr. Avanashi described. That's usually the cutoff used in research, but sometimes they look at other cutoffs as well. After that's been done, um, because we want to have a sustainable treatment ongoing, we look at reintroduction of foods, usually on a one by one basis to try and identify triggers. And at each stage along the way, there's also repeat endoscopies to see if there's been a reoccurrence of the inflammation of the esophagus. Um, and again, each of those stages is usually six to eight weeks. So this is a summary table of the different dietary approaches that have been looked at for EOE. I already mentioned their names. 
So a little more detail. So for an elemental diet, we are eliminating all intact protein, and I'll explain what that means. And this has the um, highest response rate. So 96 to 97 percent of people have a good response when they pursue this diet. The six food elimination diet um, eliminates milk, soy, eggs, wheat, seafood, and nuts or peanuts. And this has a slightly less um, high response rate, so about 70 percent. Um, and this is a bit of an approximation. Different research studies will always have um, slightly different reported rates. Then there's the four food elimination diet, which eliminates milk, wheat, egg, and soy. And this is about a 64% approximate response rate. Then there's the one food elimination diet, which is eliminating simply milk usually. Um, and interestingly, there is some research looking at strict versus liberalized for the milk elimination diet. And there's been a broad amount, a broad range of response to this one food elimination diet of 25 to 60%. And then last, this is the most recent kind of uh, dietary approach is um, a multiple staged approach where they start with a two food elimination diet of milk and wheat, um, which in the research had a 43% response rate. So 43% of participants had a good response. Um, and then if they did not respond, they pursued um, the four food elimination diet, adding egg and legumes. And again, um, if they did not respond to that, they would add the nuts and seafood for a six food elimination diet. And these are the citations from that slide. So the elemental dietary treatment for, I think we have a broad uh, mix of people in our audience today. So some people might know exactly what I mean when I talk about this and others might not. Um, as I mentioned, it is the, um, well, it was first reported in 1995 in a small study um, and it involves consuming a specialty formula where the proteins are broken down into their building blocks or amino acids. Um, symptoms do reoccur as patients reintroduced foods into their diet after consuming that specialty formula for six to eight weeks. And the specialty formulas that might be used in this type of diet include Neocate, um, Pure Amino, as well as in the States, we have Elacare um, and Pure Amino Junior. So as described, this is like the most effective dietary approach, 96 to 97% um, of participants do respond to this diet. So this is a really amazing high response rate. And the research showing this was really what first um, directed the medical community to really uh, pursue dietary treatments for this condition. It really showed that this um, condition has this strong diet component. Uh, unfortunately, there are some barriers with this elemental dietary treatment, although it is so effective, that do make it hard to implement. So it is expensive. Um, if we were to take that example that Dr. Avanashian described in his um, cases right at the beginning of that 20-month-old uh, little child, for example, say we wanted to put him on this elemental formula because we thought, oh, he drinks lots of bottles, maybe that will be um, an easier approach for him. It might cost family upwards of $650 plus tax per month. Um, and we do try to secure funding for patients, but unfortunately it can't always be guaranteed. Another barrier to implementing the elemental diet is that the taste is not great of these formulas. They do try and make flavored versions. Um, however, a liquid diet is hard for most people to pursue. And when it is a liquid diet that is not tasty, it's even harder. Um, and just as an illustration, in one of the studies, 48 out of 51 patients required nasogastric tube support, which means instead of drinking it by mouth, they were having the formula uh, provided to them by tube. Um, and so it's hard to maintain. So as Dr. Avanashi mentioned, with all these treatments, while you're on treatment, generally the EOE um, is controlled, the inflammation is controlled in the esophagus. Um, if you liberalize beyond, at some point the symptoms do reoccur. And so if you're on a liquid diet long-term, you're missing out on meals, you're missing out on the social aspects of eating. Um, so that makes this approach harder to maintain. The six and the four food elimination diets, um, they came one after the other in terms of when we started using them, but they have the same principles in that um, you are pursuing a more typical diet that's food-based. You um, we are eliminating the, the most 
common allergens that have been shown to be the most common triggers of the EOE. Uh, it is still quite restrictive, as you can imagine, eliminating um, those foods that I listed above, the milk, wheat, egg, soy, nuts, and seafood. Uh, for a child, that uh, could be a quite large uh, portion of their diet. And then if you imagine those steps where I described how we pursue, um, you know, pursue these diets with first we do the full elimination and then we reintroduce the foods one by one um, with repeat endoscopies at each stage in an effort to determine if the symptoms reoccur uh, and then we can identify which foods are the triggers. So that could take quite a long process if you're doing a reintroduction of foods one by one uh, with rescopes at each time point. Um, and that is uh, a burden on families and on our healthcare system. And unfortunately, the order is not yet standardized and nor is the duration, although, as I mentioned, um, generally six to eight weeks per phase of diet is what we do. Dr. Avanash is going to spe speak to uh, this one. I wanted to make sure you understood what a directed elimination is. While it actually sounds the most accurate and individualized, it's the idea of using allergy testing to guide your elimination. Because you say, well, I'm different than everybody else. I want to do testing, whether it's the skin prep testing or even later the antigen, uh, antigen patch testing, which is food applied to the skin, evaluated many couple days later. I want you to know that while, again, we can go into the actual literature, the response is actually quite poor and very inconsistent in addition to the barriers to access. So while it, we often still get the question of should we kind of individually test, the simple answer is no, based on these studies. And this has even come up now in the combined GI and allergy guideline, which was published uh, specifically about EOE in a recent uh, publication. So, the question is fair, but our current testing is not well designed for EOE. Thanks, Dr. Avanashi. So, um, unfortunately, that directed approach does not seem to be more effective than um, where what we call the empiric elimination, where we just eliminate the most likely allergens, which is what the classic six food elimination diet and or four food elimination diet are doing. And I wanted to share um, this table as an illustration. Um, this is taken from a study where children had undergone the six food elimination diet and they had responded to it. And then um, they were reintroduced foods one by one with repeat endoscopies um, at each stage to identify which foods were the triggers. So you can see that milk was by far the most common trigger um, amongst these patients with wheat, egg, and soy being the medium ones. And then peanut and seafood were uh, only triggers. Well, seafood was triggered in zero um, patients and peanut only in a small proportion. Um, and so this kind of gives the rationale of why sometimes we don't do the full six food elimination diet. We just do the four food, um, those top four allergens. And this also um, gives a rationale for why eventually they pursued the one food elimination diet, which is the milk elimination, because that can potentially be uh, um, an easier win where you have a smaller diet change implemented that potentially can be a, a, a win for a patient if that is already um, a significant improvement in the infl inflammation of their esophagus. Um, and other studies have done similar tables kind of summarizing which patients have um, triggers in which amounts, and this is a common repeated pattern with milk being the most likely trigger. So if you recall that summary table where I reported um, general response rates to the different diets, the milk elimination diet had 25 to 60% response. And um, it is an interesting one in that there has been a study looking at a comparison of strict versus liberalized elimination of milk. Most of the studies do strict eliminations of their um, allergens. However, because of a couple case studies where after a strict elimination and then reintroduction of milk, um, a couple of patients developed more anaphylactic type responses to the milk. That kind of led to this question, could this strict elimination 
be um, causing this and would there potentially be a benefit from pursuing a liberalized elimination diet um, and could that could you have that same benefit without that risk so this was a small study looking at that comparison um, and in the liberalized milk elimination diet they were still allowed baked products containing milk and trace sources of milk and although there wasn't a significant difference between the two groups, the um, strict elimination diet did have about a 67% response and the liberalized had a 29% response. So it seems perhaps like it might be less effective. Lastly, we have the 246 food elimination diet. This is a newer approach where they started with milk and wheat as the top two allergens. Um, and then they restrict further if there's no response to the diet. And if at some, if at each stage there is a response, then they would proceed with reintroduction of foods to determine the triggers for the EOE. And the benefit of this approach is that it has been shown to decrease the number of total endoscopies needed um, to end up on what your final dietary intervention would be in the longer term. There are still a few unknowns for dietary approaches. Um, we're always wondering how we can get to the correct food trigger with the least number of endoscopies. And of course, because we um, are taking the rationale and behind these diets from research and then implementing them in practice with real people in clinic, um, sometimes real life is a little different than how it's done in the research. And we always have these questions of, you know, um, how strict do we need to be with the eliminated food? Is baked okay? Are trace amounts okay? And um, not all those little variations are captured in the research, so it's hard to um, say for sure yes or no. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the practical uh, EOE nutrition management that we uh, pursue in clinic because we do see some concerns um, with patients of difficulty implementing diet eliminations, impaired intake due to their symptoms, restricted diet choices as a result of the dietary elimination diets, and we sometimes see undernutrition. And that can show up as nutritional deficiencies, growth delay, um, and we can have these confounding factors of food allergies or a baseline low weight or already having a very picky eater that can make it hard to um, implement these elimination diets. So a couple of points about implementing the elimination diets are not for everyone. Um, we need both children and parents to buy in. Um, parents need to be on board. They're preparing the foods, usually buying the groceries and children are the ones actually putting food in their mouths. So they need to be on board as well, as well as teens, of course, can access their own foods. Um, and so if they are not motivated, um, the diet will likely not be successful. And in our experience, girls have been more open to the dietary treatment than males. Um, in clinic, um, when you meet with a dietitian, we do describe how to actually implement an elimination diet as well as um, we do like to note that even if a patient does everything perfect, it doesn't work for everyone. And probably a third of at least of patients might not respond to the dietary intervention. Uh, so some another thing that I like to address with patients um, is if they're having impaired intake due to symptoms. So as Dr. Avanashi mentioned, we we can, some patients may have trouble swallowing. Um, they may do better with certain textures, with softer textures, moisture textures. Um, and so just working to identify those and then including more of those types of foods in the diet can help improve intake. We look to optimize calories, choose um, foods with high calorie content, um, identify some social, area, uh, social barriers around eating. So unfortunately, sometimes there can be fear or embarrassment um, around, you know, if um, different kind of eating habits have been developed to help manage these EOE symptoms. Um, there can be slow eating. So just identifying like, especially for teens, you know, if they are not eating in social settings, then you need to work on a schedule where they're gonna have opportunities to eat in, um, other times that maybe you wouldn't normally eat, you know, on a ride to school or maybe a late night snack before bed, just to make sure they get all those opportunities to have food in um, and so that they don't fall behind on their intake. A common thing we discuss with families as well is so how to deal with these restricted diet choices. If you are suddenly told to eliminate milk, soy, wheat, eggs, seafood, and nuts, 
parents are sometimes left wondering, what's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? What about convenience foods? And what about restaurants? So I tend to focus on what's left to eat. And if you'll allow me to take you on a little menu, uh, I might suggest gluten-free oatmeal with fruit and maple syrup for breakfast, maybe soup or chili for lunch, and maybe corn tortilla tacos with chicken, avocado, and salsa for dinner. And this is just some examples to show that there are a lot of um, diet options still available, but it does take a little bit of time to think about what those are. And so working with a dietitian can definitely be helpful for um, fast tracking to some of those options. Um, it's also um, work uh, pointing families towards allergy friendly packaged foods um, because um, there is a bigger population of people with the IgE mediated food allergies than there is with EOE, but they are generally eliminating those same food allergens. So a lot of these um, foods that are directed towards children with allergies are also appropriate for people with EOE on an elimination diet. And then for restaurants, uh, I always recommend to families that they do communicate with the restaurant about the allergens and do their best to avoid them. Um, however, it isn't quite the same level of stress with an IgE-mediated food allergy where um, you don't have that risk of anaphylactic reaction um, if you are cross-contaminated with the food that you have eliminated. Um, some other signs of undernutrition um, that I would address. So if you've eliminated milk from your diet, generally it's hard to um, obtain enough vitamin D and calcium, especially for young children. We don't necessarily recommend rice milk and oat milk under two years because of their low caloric density. So we often pursue supplements for these children. There are some other replacement foods um, that you can work on if someone's motivated and they really wanna do it from diet. Generally a multivitamin for someone on a six food or four food elimination diet would be a good idea and definitely growth monitoring. So just for children, making sure that they continue to grow and gain weight. And the hope is that with a dietary approach you're having symptom improvement and better able to eat. And so overall your growth should be improving. Um, but we do have to balance that with the uh, difficulties and restrictions that can also result in a decreased intake. And so this is a study just look, that did look at growth in children who had pursued dietary approaches for EOE over a 12 month period. And it was, um, and general treatment was not associated with any significant increase or decrease in expected growth over a 12 month period. Um, and I, as a dietitian, would have loved to see that it was a significant increase, but um, at least it was not a decrease. And that concludes the diet portion. Uh, Dr. So, Avanashi, I think it's going back to you. I just want to give you a bit of a time check uh, so we can get to a few questions, all right? Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. We will make sure there's time for a question. So I'll go over the medications rather quickly, knowing that we can't do justice to, you know, details of it anyways, but uh, we'll talk about that, at least the principles. So the first category of medication that's often discussed is a proton pump inhibitor or sometimes called an acid blocker. This is the main medication. It's not EOE specific. It's often uh, much more used for gastroesophageal reflux disease. As mentioned before, this does not need to be done prior to diagnosis, and that's a change. We had this uh, recategorization, so we actually have more options to consider for treatment as well. And it's not just that we're separating out reflux versus EOE. The reason for change was that demonstration of patients with EOE had symptomatic improvement around 50% at least, and even histologic improvement, and so we were missing a different group of patients. There's also basic science information suggesting that there's more than just an antacid change, that there's anti-inflammatory properties. Moving to the next category, we talk about swallowed corticosteroids. There is generally steroid phobia out there, but for the most part, we're talking about direct application of steroid to the esophagus, unopposed, that dampens the inflammation locally. 
two general ones that we use are the rep seals for budesonide, which can be compounded by a pharmacist or mixed with by yourself by Splenda, maple syrup, applesauce, that type of thing. And uh, in a minimum volume, typically of uh, one teaspoon, or it can be the sprayed in your mouth version using the metered dose and inhaler, uh, but not inhaled. So the, the method that's taught for asthma or with the spacers or chambers is not correct. In this case, we specifically have to spray it in the mouth swallow without the big inhale associated. Both of these require rinsing the mouth and not eating for half an hour. So these work reasonably effectively in studies. It's about 70% effectiveness. And if you remember Kirsten's slide, she's referring to many of these dietary things as good as 70%. Doses can be adjusted and there are some suggested guidelines for age as well as size, but uh, we're usually using uh, somewhere between two and four puffs would be the most common, although there is a wide variety. And one thing, the rinsing the mouth is to help prevent thrush, which can be a side effect in up to 5% of people. Also like the dietary unknowns, most of these studies truly have been described for 12 weeks, even up to 52 weeks, but we know with a chronic condition, we need better data and following in the long term. But the perfect methodology of what's the best way to follow, is it just use it sometimes? Do you use it when you have symptoms? Do you use it seasonally? Do you use it at a full dose or can you drop the dose? Is a bit uh, of that kind of art part of the medicine. And personally, we aim for the ongoing treatment using the lowest effective dose. So there are times where if it's demonstrated to be a response or, uh, responsive patient, then we'll drop the dose and still see if that dose works for them. Practically, I can say that uh, we've had patients on these medications for well more than five years, although there is public sh published safety data for at least five years of use of these medications. And obviously, they're the same medications used for asthma, which we know has been around for decades longer. So presently, these aren't EOE-specific medications. So this comes back to tying it up. Everything makes you decide uh, based on what the family wants, patient wants, factors of do they have multiple food, other allergies, are they already on steroids, what's their motivation, and that's what goes into the treatment option. So if it was one effective option, it'd be a lot simpler, but that's why it comes back to this teeter-tower balance. And uh, essentially what we're telling you is, as Kirsten highlights, you need follow-up. Uh, we do have to support families. That's why we want the dietitians involved, even if it's just for information sharing. We often talk to an allergist for support, especially if they already have other food allergies, and we work with them to work what they can do in the short term and the long term. I will tell you, we said we want everything to be perfect, but first and foremost, I say the patient should have fewer symptoms. We want to do no harm. And uh, even over my practice over many years, I have to say my intensity of following may have uh, you know, shifted to that. I feel I couldn't follow most stable patients every one to two years now and just make sure we have tabs. But the, uh, the point of this slide is to say the actual number of eosinophils isn't the end all and the be all. It's about how the patient's overall coping, how's their quality of life and their symptoms combined. So with that, it, it, we haven't left too much time for questions, but I really want to uh, get to a few of them. Thanks for your time today. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, and yes, we did get we did get a lot of questions, so, um, both before the webinar and during the webinar. And I can tell you that um, it's clear that we're we're going to have to schedule some more of these type of activities so that we can answer more questions. I'm going to ask you to both turn on your webcam so we can see you, and we'll get to uh, the first questions. Kirsten, uh, there you are. Terrific. Okay, thanks again. So I want to get to um, a few of these questions, and I think we'll take 10 minutes. We're going to end up going over our webinar time, but I'm hoping that you both have the time that we can go a little bit over. Sure. Um, yeah. So the first one is around uh, just how common is EOE um, uh, and how, how do people screen for it in, in patients in either an in-community or a private practice? 
Thanks. So it is something that we've described uh, and in the literature supports, there's both an increasing incidence and prevalence. So that means there's new cases seem to be going up. And then of course, because it doesn't go away, there's more and more people have it. So it is some have described in the rare disease type category, but we do say the prevalence can be as much as like one in a thousand now. That'd be on the high side of estimates. So it's getting to the point where I wouldn't say there's general population familiarity with it, but it is increasing. Um, the comment about how do you screen for it, as mentioned, there's no blood test. Uh, we, we are, there's lots of research on that, but there's no specific screen test like there is, for example, celiac. Now you go for one test. So it is just putting together a bit, knowing a few of those risk factors, either directly asking about the symptoms, uh, and then obviously just putting two and two together. Like yesterday, we saw a patient um, who had, uh, similar to our second case of the infant, uh, was actually admitted to hospital for poor growth and, and oral aversion. And the fact that they had an atopic background, I still don't know if that patient's going to have uh, EOE, but it's just putting a few things together. So okay. that's and why just we have the, the risk factors. Thank you. And on the prevalence piece or how common it is, is, is it uh, as common in adults? Like, it, it, can you speak to that in terms of what yeah. the profile of that looks like? I think it is. Um, I mean, this is a condition where it's described well in adults and pediatrics. Um, I think a bit of the mentality of scoping without doing biopsies is something that's mean we haven't found it as much uh, because we have consistent protocols for biopsying in every patient that we're even considering and even sometimes routine. But I think it's there in adults. I honestly do think there's a factor of male adults not wanting to uh, get things figured out and parents often a little bit more keen to let's get to the bottom of this as fast as we can, as opposed to I've been dealing with this for a while, I'm fine type attitudes. And sometimes even in that same family where um, the parent, we're encouraging the parents to say, hey, you've told us you have similar symptoms, go get them checked out. Okay, terrific. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Kirsten, related to uh, the dietary management. There's a few questions of clarification that came in, one on the milk elimination diet. Is this one cow's milk only, or is it all dairy? And, and how do we think about breast milk? So it is uh, primarily a cow's milk elimination, and so it would include all dairy products that include um, cow's milk, and particularly we're thinking about the cow's milk protein is the trigger. So um, that would include breast milk if the mother is consuming dairy and someone is still breastfed. And then as well, we do know that other mammal milks usually are quite similar in their proteins. So as a general rule, we recommend avoiding other mammal milks as well. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, now, there was a question back on diagnostics. Um, and so it was, we've got some people in the audience that are curious about the advancement in diagnostics and monitoring efficacy namely the unsedated transnatal scoping. Um, where's that at, uh, Dr. Avanashi? Sure, so um, that's a cool question and it's something I'm kind of excited about. So there has been a lot of studies about can we check blood, urine, swabs, this, that, and the other, and they're essentially not giving us the related information. So although it's not um, a biomarker going through a less invasive scope because the anesthetic is a big deal for a lot of our patients. It adds to the delay of evaluation. It's a big fear. They don't like the sensation, the IV, for example, and that type of thing. So there's the use of thin, uh, really thinner scopes than what we're using on a standard basis put through the nose just to get long enough there. And um, initially, this idea has been around for a long time in adults, but is even validated now in the U.S. Center with 700 kids. And so we've been talking about this. I mean, I have to say things are probably on hold where I had a lot of excitement about this. I even had, had someone say, can I make a donation towards this, which is fantastic. But realistically, right now, things are on pause. Even our scopes were paused for three months because every form of endoscopy is technically considered an aerosol generating procedure. And there's a whole bunch more cautions around that right now. So there's infrastructure that has to be placed, but it's been shown to be safe. So you can get away with often virtual reality goggles. You do the scope with a thinner one through the nose. Kids as young as three have done it, although I personally would pick the older kids to try something like this. And if they want, 
Uh, and it's a really exciting next step process. A little bit increased risk about bleeding in the nose, but for the most part, well tolerated with a cooperative young adult or adult. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, Kirsten, back to you with some questions. Uh, there were lots of questions on, on the diet part. So I think that there's going to be, uh, that's a, uh, um, a predictor of, of what we might wanna look at in the future for another webinar. Um, so uh, around trigger foods, can you eat, and you touched on this a little bit, can you eat uh, your trigger food in limited amounts? Um, but the question is, do you risk further damage? Because you talked a little bit about, you know, it's not the same mm -hmm. as IgE mediated, but is yeah. there damage in there? Yeah, so it's always hard to come up with a hard line for our families. I think, um, What's been shown in the evidence uh, in the research is usually a stricter elimination. And so um, we would steer a little more towards that, but we always work with families to see what's doable for them. And so if um, some trace amounts does make it more doable, then we talk with the physician to see um, if maybe that would be okay. And the most important thing is that um, patients are consistent with how they're following the diet. And that when we do a repeat endoscopy, that we know that that will represent what the level of the inflammation is with the diet that they're currently following. And then we can make an uh, informed decision as to whether or not that diet is working for them. So it really becomes really individualized um, in, the, in the clinic setting, um, but the research is all based on, for the most part, stricter eliminations. Okay, terrific, thank you. And Dr. Avanashi, did you wanna add anything or? Yeah, I was gonna add a couple of things. So I do think sometimes the bias of what we offer is if a patient already has multiple food allergy, that's probably a circumstance we'll wanna be actually less strict um, as opposed to more strict. And then sometimes it's about time course and how long they've been doing it. We know that if they go back to it, they've demonstrated it works. Um, and so we try not to like do it very much upfront, but, you're right, the answer of, you know, can you have a weekly exposure versus every two weeks versus once a month, we actually have to figure that out. And it's hard to standardize nutritional intake. Right. Thank you. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to one around reactions. How, do, how does someone uh, differentiate between an EOE allergic reaction versus an anaphylactic reaction? Uh, so, yeah, so for the most part, as we mentioned, it's a mixed Ig, non Ig. So there, we're not mostly worried about immediate reactions. Immediate reactions within an hour or half an hour are typically IgE. Now, one of the areas that can be confusing is let's say you get food stuck and it's, I don't know, chicken breast. Is that a reaction to chicken breast? Not likely. It may be associated with, oh, I can't eat chicken or this is the food that triggered my UE, but the EOE and the inflammation was built from much more earlier than before that. And that's why it's not, it's associated, but not actually implicated. So that's one of those confusing areas, but there's no immediate reactions from EOE. It's typically a gradual build. Okay, great. Okay, now this is a, from an educator, a question from an educator. So uh, what do I need to do to keep a student with EOE safe in the classroom? That's a good question. Um, maybe particularly with COVID uh, times and kind of extra cautions around school. So this is hard, especially if someone has, let's say, more of a vomiting type symptom or presentation as part of them. I think it's important to know that, you know, a reflex is to send them home. Either it's infectious until proven otherwise, and especially if it's a part, a well-described part of their symptomatology. That's important for the teachers slash uh, schools to know. I don't worry a lot about immediate food safety, especially about like, let's say you're on an elimination diet and others around you are eating it or it's even come across the same table. As mentioned by Kirsten, I think that's less the worry. Choking safety is one of those things. And again, most cases where we're talking about food impaction, it's not blocking the airway. Uh, but anytime, obviously, if there's a concern that they can't swallow their spit, Airway concerns are different. You can't breathe, you can't speak typically, and that's, you know, 911 emergency. But if food is stuck, let that person, maybe accompany them and let them have a little bit of space. Sometimes it'll last for a sip of water, sometimes it'll retch and vomit, and for the most part, that's fine. But don't induce their vomiting. Don't be sticking your fingers in their mouth or have them do that or give them anything that makes them throw up. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we um, are we have run out of time, and I know people schedule uh, pretty religiously their their time so that they can move on to what's next on their agenda. So 
I want to thank you very much for taking the time um, and uh, joining us today. And we will be certainly talking more about EOE uh, uh, and the treatment options again in the future. So you can, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna spend a few minutes just wrapping up and thanking our sponsors. So you can turn your, uh, your webcam off. Um, as everyone uh, in our audience is aware, we are, uh, Food Allergy Canada is a, a not-for-profit charity um, and uh, look to, uh, we're completely re reliant on donations um, for the support of the work that we do. Uh, and so if you can consider a donation to our organization, we would greatly appreciate it. We would also like to thank our sponsors for this event, EpiPen, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Peanut Bureau of Canada, and Allergect. Now you will be receiving um, uh, shortly a survey that we would like to um, have you complete. Um, and so if you would please take a few moments to uh, provide us with uh, some of your feedback, particularly since we are likely to do another webinar on this topic. And so your feedback really helps us inform uh, the type of content we should be thinking about uh, in the future on this topic. So thank you everyone for joining us today and for your participation in today's webinar. You can view a recording of this webinar at Food Allergy Canada shortly. Uh, and we would welcome for you to share that with others who you think may benefit from this content. That now concludes our webinar.